Hello and welcome to video lecture series in political science. Today we are going to discuss chapter 2 titled as Freedom from your 11th class textbook Political Theory. For understanding we have divided this chapter into four parts. We have already started this chapter by understanding what is meant by freedom and we have taken some example of prominent personalities such as Nelson Mandela, Suchi and Mahatma Gandhi and we have discussed how these people laid down their lives for the value of freedom. Today we will discuss what freedom means or how do political scientists define freedom. Let us begin. Simply stating freedom is a condition which enables individuals to develop their potential and capabilities without any fear or constraints. Freedom is understood as absence of constraints upon an individual's thought or action. It means to have minimum restrictions placed upon the individuals so that they can make their choices freely and act according to their will. A free society is one that enables its individuals to pursue their interest without any fear or restraint. Freedom is autonomy that is to decide about one's own destiny. But total or complete absence of constraint can also lead to chaos, anarchy or disorder in society which can lead to lawlessness that is there is no law prevailing or people are not bound by any law. Everyone does whatever he or she feels like. No individual living in a society or who is part of any society can hope to enjoy complete absence of any type of restriction or constraints. Today we will discuss why do we need constraints and what are the various sources of these constraints in society. Now let us understand what do we mean by constraints. Constraints or restrictions are limits placed upon an individual that are imposed by either family, group, elders, community, association or by any other social organization which you are a part of or which an individual is part of. When we talk of constraints it is important to differentiate between which social constraints are justified and which cannot be justified. That is what sort of restrictions are acceptable and to what extent and which are to be done away with which are not necessary in society. In order to understand which social constraints or limitations are necessary and to what extent it is important for us to look at the relationship between the individual and the society or the relationship between the individual and the group, community or state which he or she is part of. Locating the individual within society helps us to analyze in what areas of life or spheres individual has the freedom to choose, decide or act and what are the spheres where he cannot decide about his life or his actions. It is also crucial to analyze which features are desirable and which are not and should be removed and which should not be removed or continued with. For example, among Hindus whom to marry and whom not to marry is determined according to one's caste community. So this is the sphere where others decide about you or are you allowed to, allowed to decide about yourself. The nature of constraints, the degree of restrictions placed upon the individual and the prevailing set of rules and regulation may be seen as curtailing freedom of choice of an individual. For example, the case of whom to marry within the caste community. But at times these are necessary for general security and order in society. Let us discuss about the sources of these constraints like who can place constraint upon you or who is allowed to restrict your freedom. The first point is that Restrictions on freedom of an individual can be placed by government which is a legitimate agency. An individual may be citizen of a free nation or independent nation. Yet he is not completely free. He is bound by the law of that country. He is bound by the constitution that gives him certain set of rights and also demands certain set of duties to be fulfilled towards the nation as a citizen, the nation to which he belongs. Such restrictions operating in the form of law are mostly formal and legal in nature. 
they are pre-coded or codified in constitution. Such restrictions exist to ensure freedom of all that is everyone in society rather than only one individual to those who can impose themselves upon the others. Some form of government or governance that can control is thus inevitable or necessary for us to regulate our behavior. If the government is democratic, then the members of the state can exercise or retain some form of control over the people who rule over us. Otherwise, it becomes highly authoritative where people cannot raise their voice against the government and the government does whatever it wants to do. That is why the democratic government is considered to be an important means of protecting the freedom of the people in any society or nation. Now, what is the second source of restraint or restrictions? Restrictions on freedom of individual can also come from domination and external control such as restrictions may be imposed by government through laws which are backed by force. Now, what is the difference between the first and the second? As against the sovereign government of a nation, the constraints by the foreign rulers are severe and often backed by ruthless force and coercion. You have seen that ruthless force and coercion imposed by the British on Indians on many of the social, economic and political rights of the individual which were not given to people in India under the British rule. Let us discuss the third source of restraint. Apart from the government sanction, constraints on freedom can also come from social institutions or prevailing economic inequality in society. For example, caste system. Caste system categorizes people into different social strata placed in a hierarchy one above the other on the basis of ranking. The upper caste groups place restrictions over individuals in the lower caste groups or categories. They stop them to visit the temples. They curtail their freedom of movement or drinking water from a particular village well or taking up certain professions in the village. Now, you must have read in history that social reform movement along with freedom struggle was a movement to bring about social change in the traditional stru social structure of Indian society and it challenged caste inequality and domination. It was realized by the freedom fighters that freedom from foreign rule was insufficient unless we free ourselves from the age-old tradition that placed constraint over individuals in society, over women, over low caste group in the name of norms and religious traditions. Now, in this context, along with social reformers, the freedom fighters too were of the opinion that India needs to get rid of caste inequality in order to prosper and develop. Social reformers in the early 20th century attempted to redefine and restructure traditional roles of women, such as women were traditionally defined as a wife, a good wife, a good daughter, homemaker and they also advocated for the widow remarriage. It was seen as crucial for nation to become modern, but also retain its ancient heritage by having a self-conscious pride in Indian culture and tradition. Even after independence, our constitution was designed to give people equal rights. It was based on the principle of social justice. You must be knowing that preamble of constitution of India starts with these words, we the people of India. These words have immense constitutional and political significance. They mean that people are the source of the constitution, we the people, we together make it. It is the people of India who are the makers of the constitution. It is also implied that there is a popular sovereignty in India and everyone is equal and is given the same set of rights in our society. Now, let us elaborate a bit on the preamble. The preamble states that we resolve to secure to all its citizens, that is, give all its citizens, number one, justice, justice which is social, economic and political justice. It secures liberty, liberty of what? Liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship, that is, guaranteeing this justice and liberty to all. Further, the preamble talks of equality. Equality again of what? Equality of status and opportunity and promote this equality of status and opportunity among 
all the members in society irrespective of their caste, economic, social or any other affiliation. And finally, it talks of fraternity that is assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation. Combining the opinion of the social reformers and freedom fighters, it would be interesting to note what Subhash Chandra Bose said during the presidential address he delivered at the students conference held at Lahore on 19th October 1929. What did Subhash Chandra Bose say? He said that if we are to bring about a revolution of ideas, we have first to hold up before us an ideal which will galvanize our whole life. Galvanize means the change our whole life. That ideal is freedom. But freedom is a word which has varied connotations. Connotations means meaning. Even in our country, the concept of freedom has undergone a process of evolution. By freedom, I mean all around freedom. That is, freedom for the individual as well as for the society freedom for the rich as well as for the poor, freedom for men as well as for the women, freedom of all individuals and for all classes. This freedom implies not only emancipation from political bondage, he is talking about the British Raj in this context, but it also means equal distribution of wealth, abolition of caste barriers and social inequities and destruction of communalism and religious intolerance. Now let us see why do we need constraints in a society after understanding that how important is freedom both from traditions and from the foreign rule. So far we have discussed that freedom means an act or to act without any restriction or limitations. But it is equally true that we cannot live in a world or society where there are no constraints. It might sound confusing that on one hand we talk of freedom and on the other we talk about placing restrictions. But let us clarify through some discussion. We need some constraints or restrictions or rules to regulate behavior of people in society. Otherwise society will descend into chaos. These constraints can be laws or rules governing our behavior in everyday life. Prescribed by governmental agencies, groups, association, communities or families, these, these rules or regulations govern our behavior. A child in a family is governed by the norms or rules of the family. He acts in accordance with these rules and these rules act as a constraint on his behavior and he remains in discipline. For instance, while driving, you stop when the light turns red at the traffic signal. This is a constraint on your driving, but it helps the other drivers on the road. You know how signals control traffic and flow of vehicles? Otherwise, there will be utter chaos on roads and nobody will be able to move anywhere. In the similar fashion, differences among people exist over ideas, ambitions, control of scarce resources and many other things. People have disagreement over issues of any type, from trivial to very serious matters. People can fight over parking spaces, over small piece of land or property. Some people may raise issues pertaining to screening of certain films or documentaries which they find offending. You name it and you will find people having conflict or clash of ideas of, over almost everything that you can imagine. At times, these conflicts stretch over a long period of time and they also become violent in nature. So in such a case, every society needs some mechanism to control such conflicts, violence and settle the disputes between people. Had there been no disagreement among people over any issue, big or small, there was no need of constraints. But rules are important for regulating behavior of people and minimize conflicts among them. If people can respect each other's view, do not try to impose their views upon the other, then actually there is no need for any kind of law or legal procedure to govern or discipline their behavior. The need emerges only because people tend to think their choices are better than others and they try to impose their choice upon the other people. Ideally speaking, in a free society, People must hold free views. 
they must have ability to develop their own rules of living and pursue their choices. But this type of free society can exist only when there are some basic minimum rules governing these societies and people's behavior. That is, there is simple agreement over how do we or how are we going to behave or behave with others in society. At least people must be willing to accept the opinion of others as well, if do not agree to it. At times, people are so committed to their beliefs that they refuse to accept any other alternative perspective. That is, they do not even entertain the other idea. Driven by or overpowered by their own ideas, these people see the other views and ways of living as absolutely unacceptable. Such situations lead to conflict or friction among these people or within these two groups. In such situations, we need some legal and political framework that can put restraint or check upon the groups to ensure that the differences of opinion may be discussed and debated in the healthy environment and people agree over, at least they listen to each other. Everyone should get equal chance and opportunity without one group imposing itself upon the other group. Thus, law or legal framework in a way even if constrains the people, but it also protects the freedom of everybody in society. But then you may question that how much control, restraint or restriction is justified or necessary? What are the areas where one should be controlled? Is there any area where we need greater control as compared to some area where lesser control is required? Or who can control you? You may ask a wide variety of such questions and it is important to discuss these answers as well because they pertain to your rights, they pertain to your freedom. We will discuss about all such questions as political theorists do in the next part of this chapter. To conclude, let us summarize what we discussed in this lecture. We started our discussion with the concept of freedom. What is freedom and how freedom is an important fundamental value? Why freedom is necessary? But if everyone is driven by his own interest, there will be chaos in society. So we need some constraint over individual freedom to protect freedom of all in society. What are these constraints? And we discussed about what are the various sources of these limitations or constraints on individual behavior that bring general order in society. In the next part of this chapter, we'll discuss about or in greater detail about why do we need constraints upon our behavior. Till then, you can enjoy reading this part of the chapter. Thank you.